Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Podcast. Today is Friday, October 4th, 2019. Today I'm going to recap the NLDS games from yesterday and look ahead and pick the ALDS games for today and the NLDS games for today and the ALDS series as well. Go over the Thursday night football game between the Seahawks and the Rams. College football games from last night as well. Picks for college football in the NFL, NHL we'll talk to, and best bet of the day. Okay, we're going to start with baseball because that is the hottest ticket right now. The Cardinals come out and win game one over the Braves by a score of 7-6. to six. The big story in this game is that young superstar Ronald Acuna Jr. thought he had a home run and then he like, trotted slowly and it realized it wasn't a home run so he ended up with a 336 foot single so much controversy here because obviously he was benched for not running out on a similar play in the regular season and then the manager Brian Snicker did not bench him in in the playoff game which was the right thing to do because this is a game in which you're trailing and need your best players to win so I support the decision not to bench Acuna because if what if um, the Braves came back and won that game? Then you could say, well, Acuna was a part of it. Acuna did end up hitting a home run in that game to make it interesting again after the incident. So I support the decision to keep him in the game. And I don't think they'll bench him today for that incident. It's not the regular season. It's the playoffs. Must win game two pretty much or else you don't want to be down 0-2 going to St. Louis where that crowd's going to be ruckus for their first playoff game at home since 2015. So that was obviously the big story of the game yesterday. Meanwhile, getting the win for the Cardinals was Carlos Martinez and getting charged with the loss was Mark Melanson. And by the way, it was a 4-3 to three score in the ninth inning alone with the Cardinals Obviously scoring the four and the Braves scoring the three. Mark Melanson charged with the loss. The key um, bullpen addition they made, he sucked. Chris Martin got injured in this game and didn't even throw a pitch. And obviously he's out for the series and um, Julio Tehran was added to the roster. So maybe uh, Tehran becomes like the long man out of the bullpen. And Chris Martin obviously they got from the Rangers, gave up Kobe Allard to get him. I thought that was a lopsided trade in favor of the Rangers anyway, and that just made it look even better because Kobe Allard could have helped them in the series. And Chris Martin was solid down the stretch for Atlanta, but I just think that Allard is, could potentially be a stud pitcher someday, whether that's in a starter's role or as a reliever. So that trade acquisition not looking so hot as he's on the injured list. The Lansing got charged with the loss. Luke Jackson was terrible. He was their ex-closer. Shane Green saw time in this game. I think he was fine, though. I'm going to go through the stats in a minute. So, bottom of the first, fielder's choice, Josh Donaldson. The Cardinals should have possibly gotten a double play on that, but no. There was an error on Colton Wong. Run scores, one nothing Atlanta. Top of the fifth, RBI ground out, Dexter Fowler, 1-1. Bottom of the sixth, infield single, Dansby Swanson. Two-run score on the error by Paul DeYoung. 3-1 Braves. Top of the eighth, home run Paul Goldschmidt makes it 3-2. Top of the eighth as well, RBI single Matt Harp in there. 3-3. Top of the ninth, the biggest hit of the game. Two-run double by Marcelo Zuna made it 5-3. And another big hit, two-run double by Colton Wong made it 7-3. If it wasn't for the Wong double, the Braves win this game. So their bullpen probably deserves more blame than... It's getting because all everybody's focusing on is Acuna, 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 and how if he actually ran hard, he would be at second base and maybe they score an extra run. But the reality is the Braves' bullpen blew this game, and I thought this was the weakest unit of the six units in this series. So, and I was proven right for at least game one. And then bottom of the ninth, Two-run shot by Acuna made it 7-5. So it looks good that um, Brian Snicker didn't bench him. And then Freddie Freeman homered it off of Carlos Martinez to make it 7-6.
and at least the Braves made it interesting in the ninth. But I think the ultimate reality is that the Braves bullpen did not get the job done here, regardless of the whole Acuna situation. So that's why the Cardinals won game one. They got the big hits off the Braves bullpen. And uh, very good job by the Cardinals going out and winning game one. I picked them to win this series as well, and I feel even better about that prediction as we go forward here in the series. Pitching lines, uh, Miles Miklas, mm, a little unlucky with the errors and stuff. Five innings, three hits, and a run, two walks, two strikeouts. Tyler Webb, a third of an inning, a hit, and a run, a walk, and no strikeouts. Giovanni Galejos, two-thirds of an inning and a hit and two strikeouts. And uh, John Brebbia, a third of an inning, a hit, no strikeouts. Andrew Miller went one inning, didn't give anything up. And before Carlos Martinez came in, Ryan Helsley, um, a third of an inning and a hit, and then Martinez... In an inning and a third, two hits, three runs, a walk, two strikeouts. I'm a little worried about Carlos Martinez in the series. Maybe we overrated him a little bit, and his success as a closer um, may have just come against uh, very inferior teams. He had that collapse against the Cubs, and then the Cardinals ended up winning that game. Almost blew it in this game against the Braves. So that's something to monitor going forward. And I'd put Andrew Miller as your closer, not Carlos Martinez. That's just my opinion. Meanwhile, the Braves pitching. Dallas Keuchel wasn't bad. Four and two-thirds innings, five hits in a run, three walks, no strikeouts. Darren O'Day, a third of an inning, did his job. Shane Green, an inning, a hit, and a walk. Max Freed, out of the bullpen, an inning, and two strikeouts. Chris Martin didn't even throw a pitch because he was on the mound and he was just injured before he even got a chance to throw a pitch. We talked about that already. Luke Jackson, terrible. Two-thirds of an inning, three hits, two runs, no walks, and a strikeout. Mark Melanton was the scapegoat of this game. An inning, five hits, four runs, two walks, and a strikeout. And then Sean Newcomb out of the bullpen, a third of an inning, and a strikeout. So, game two, 4.30, TVS. We'll talk about that game in a minute. Dodgers over to Nationals, 6 nothing. An impressive statement win here for the Dodgers. Walker Buehler gets the win. Patrick Corbin the loss. Bottom of the first. Patrick Corbin looked very shaky. He looked like he was about to implode. Similar to Charlie Morton on Wednesday night in the wild card game. But um, despite giving up the uh, bases loaded walk to Max Monty and giving the Dodgers a one nothing lead, Corbin got out of it. And um, he pretty much saved himself from getting mocked on Twitter. Bottom of the fifth. Bellinger scores on the error by Howie Kendrick. Max Muncy safe at first on the error by Kendrick. And then uh, Chris Taylor advances to second, and then he was thrown out at home plate. 2 0 Dodgers. Bottom of the seventh RBI single for Max Muncy. Actually drove in two runs. 4 0 Dodgers. Bottom of the eighth, Gavin Lux home run. 5 0 Dodgers. And then Jock Peterson home run. 6 0 Dodgers. A really nice win in game one for the Dodgers. Takes the monkey off their back a little bit. And. Puts pressure on the Nationals to go out and win game two. But I was always told you're never in trouble in a series until you lose a home game. That's something I've always learned through uh, watching sports all these years. That if you lose a home game, you're in trouble. Walker Buehler, six innings, a hit, no one runs rocks, and eight strikeouts. He was brilliant. Adam Korolik, a third of an inning and a strikeout. Kenta Maeda, a th- an inning and two-thirds and two strikeouts. Joe Kelly actually looked good. An inning, a hit, and two strikeouts. He was terrible in the regular season. So, and it's a nice sign if you're the Dodgers going forward in the playoffs. If Joe Kelly gives you scoreless innings, then I think he can be trusted and uh, his regular season woes can be forgotten. Patrick Corbin, six innings, straight to run, five walks, nine strikeouts. Quality start for the five walks is very alarming to me. Following him in the bullpen was Tanner Rainey. A third of an inning, a hit, two and runs a walk and a strikeout. Fernando Rodney, two thirds of an inning, a hit, no one runs a walk and a strikeout. And Hunter Strickland with a bad inning um, with two hits, two and runs and a strikeout. And game number two is tonight at 9.30 on TBS. We'll preview and pick it in a couple of minutes. 
Now we're going to pick the AL series is for the division round. We're going to start with the Astros and the Rays. Game one's this afternoon. We'll preview game one in a couple minutes. Now we're just going to preview the series here. The Astros, to me, are the best team in baseball. No doubt about it. They have the best record in baseball. And they're 2-1 to one World Series favorites for that simple reason alone. The Rays are coming off a nice win in the wild card game against the Athletics in Oakland. The Rays' offense is not good as a whole, but their position players are pretty good. And there are guys that could put together good at-bats. Austin Meadows, Tommy Pham, Brandon Lau, Avisel Garcia, Yandy Diaz. The Astros' offense is loaded in deep, led by MVP favorite Alex Bregman, Jose Altuve, rookie Jordan Alvarez, Carlos Correa, Michael Brantley. The Rays' starting staff is the strength of their team, led by Charlie Morton, Blake Snell, and Tyler Glasnow. The Astros' starting staff is also the strength of their team, led by the big three of Justin Verlander, Garrett Cole, and Zach Greinke. The Rays' bullpen is very good, led by Emilio Pagan, trade edition, Nick Anderson, Diego Castillo, and Colin Pache. The Astros' bullpen could be good at times, led by closer and Roberto Osuna, who I trust in a big spot. Ryan Presley, who's been good most of this year. Will Harris, he's solid. And Chris Davinsky, who has had some bad moments this season, but I've seen him get big outs in October before. That said, I don't see the Rays' offense having success against the Astros' big three of starters, and that'll be the difference here. It's the Astros go to their third ALCS in a row. Prediction, Astros in four games. And then you have the Twins against the Yankees. Twins are three seed, the Yankees are two seed. The Twins have had a fantastic season. Rocco Baldelli's first season as manager, and here they are in the, as division champions. The Yankees sends a ton of regular season injuries are here with home field advantage for this round, and they won their division as well. The Twins offense is lights out, led by Nelson Cruz, Max Kepler, Jorge Polanco, and Eddie Rosario. The Yankees offense is potent, too, led by Aaron Judge, Glaber Torres, DJ LeMayu, Gary Sanchez, and Giancarlo Stanton. The Twins starting pitching is not left to be desired with guys like Jose Barrios, who has struggled the last two months, Jake Odorizzi, and Martin Perez. The Yankees starting pitching is better than it's perceived, led by James Paxton, Masahiro Tanaka, and Luis Severino. The Twins' bullpen is not good whatsoever, although closer Trevor Rogers had a nice year, and guys like Sergio Romo, Zach Little, and Drew Smeltzer have had moments. Meanwhile, the Yankees' bullpen is awesome, led by closer Aralus Chapman, Zach Britton, Adam Adovino, Tommy Canely, and occasional opener Shane, or I'm sorry, Chad Green, who may open playoff games if necessary. The Yankees are the more superior team here, especially on the pitching end of the spectrum, as they'll advance to their second ALCS in three seasons to set up a highly anticipated rematch with the Astros. Prediction, Yankees in four games. All right, today, game one, Rays Astros, 2 o'clock, Fox Sports 1, Kenny Albert, David Cohn on the call, I believe there's a third member. It's probably going to be A.J. Prasinski. And then John Paul Morosi is probably your sideline reporter. Pitching matchup is nice. You have Tyler Glass now against Justin Verlander. Verlander always lights out in the postseason. He's Mr. Reliable. Tyler Glass now's first career playoff game. I don't know if I could trust him to uh, pitch a quality outing here in Houston. But you never know. So I'm going to go with the Astros, and I'm going to say low-scoring game. I'm going to say Glasnow struggles early, gets it together, Rays bullpen does the job to keep the Rays in the game. But ultimately, Houston, Verlander will go seven, and then you pass it off to Will Harris and Roberto Osuna. I'm going to say the Astros win this game by a score of 4-1 to one at home to take a 1-0 series lead. Game 2, 4.30, TBS, Cardinals, Braves, Brian Anderson, Ron Darling on the call. Cardinals obviously won game 1. We talked about the whole Cunha thing. They had their ace going today in Jack Flaherty, and then Atlanta sitting on Mike Fultonevich, who I thought would have a breakout season this year. That didn't really happen for him. He was in the minors a lot this season. Jack Flaherty is incredible. Absolutely. But I just am feeling a Braves bounce back here. I think the series will go 5. 
I think that Acuna will play better. I think that the um, Braves bullpen will be a little better than it was. And I think Fulton Nevich can go um, six quality innings. And I think this is a lower scoring game than it was in the first game. So give me four to three Braves. And I'm going to say the Cardinals bullpen shows some leaks here. The non-Andrew Miller guys, obviously, like Galijos and Barabia. Like some of those guys I wasn't impressed with yesterday. Martinez I'm concerned with. I think Andrew Miller should be their closer. I'm going to say Cards bullpen kind of blows up in their face a little bit. 4-3 Braves in what should be a great game. 7 o'clock MLB Network, Twins Yankees. Bob Costas with John Smaltz, Tom Verducci, and Ken Rosenthal on the call. This is like the all-star announcing crew. And I know three of those guys will be on the Fox broadcasts. Obviously Costas will not. He's MLB Network. So he has this game in terms of play-by-play duties. Should be an interesting game. It's Jose Barrios against James Paxton. Barrios, as I mentioned earlier, struggled down the stretch of the season. Meanwhile, James Paxton's been red hot to close out the season. He had a butt issue in his last start against the Rangers last week. But I think he's fine, and they took him out for precautionary reasons. Paxton at home is much better than Paxton on the road, and that is well documented. I think he'll have a nice game, maybe five innings, three runs, nine strikeouts, five hits, or something like that. I think the Twins can hit some home runs here off of Paxton to make him look somewhat vulnerable. But Barrios is where I'm worried about. He's had a bad second half, and Yankee Stadium at night in October, I don't think is ideal for somebody like Barrios. So I think the Yankees come out and win game one by a score of 6-3. to three. I think in this game that there will be more than three homers, probably more by the Yankees than the Twins, obviously. So 6-3 Yankees led by the bullpen there at the end of the game. I think Paxton will manage through five, and then they go to their big four with Ottavino, Canely, Britton, Chapman, game over. And I think Aaron Judge will have a big game. I think that DJ LeMay will have a big game. Glaber Torres will have a finally have a postseason moment. So Yankees will win game one, 6-3. And then last but not least, the Nationals at the Dodgers, 9-30 TBS, Ernie Johnson and Jeff Frank Corr on the call. Dodgers coming off the game one win. Pitching matchup in this game is Steven Strasburg and Clayton Kershaw. This is interesting. I'm going to go with the upset here. I'm going to take the Nationals here on the road to uh, even this thing up at one apiece. Steven Strasburg's had a stellar playoff um, track record. Sub-1 ERA in the playoffs as far as I'm concerned, including, obviously, those scoreless innings from the wild card game. Clayton Kershaw, meanwhile, has had a rocky playoff history, rocky history in big games, not only in the playoffs but in the regular season as well, but it's more documented in the playoffs. So I think the Nationals will come out. They'll hit some homers. I think Kershaw is somebody that is still a good pitcher, but I think Steven Strasburg's better than Clayton Kershaw right now. That's just how I feel. And the Dodgers are big favorites. So my underdog special of the night is the Washington Nationals. Do I think they'll win the series? Absolutely not. But I just think that they'll win this game. So give me the Nationals to win game number two on the road. And what I think will be a close game. Kershaw will be okay, but not a disaster per se. But I don't trust the Dodgers bullpen in a close game. The Dodgers, the pressure wasn't on them last night to... uh, Keep that uh, to, uh, you know, not uh, let the Nats back in that game because it was 6 nothing. But if it's close, I don't trust the Dodgers' bullpen. So give me the Nationals tonight by a score of 6-4. to four. And I think Kershaw, I'm going to say, is like a five innings, three runs, and then the bullpen gives up the rest. But it's not going to be a good look for Kershaw if uh, the Nationals put up three runs and five innings off of him. So, um... Nationals win the game by a score of 6-4, to and this game will be a higher scoring late as the bullpens uh, will give up their fair share of runs. I think Strasburg will pitch well. 
I could see like a seven inning two run from Strasburg. So give me the Nats here. And so the picking two teams I'm not even picking to win their own series is to win tonight. And that is obviously the Braves and the Nationals. So there's the baseball picks for the weekend. We had an NFL game last night in case you missed it. The Seahawks defeated the Rams by a score of 30-29. to I got my pick right. I said the Rams plus one and a half was the play. They covered, but ultimately they did not win. Rams dropped the 3-2. and two. Seahawks are in first place with a record of 4-1. and one. Well, it's really the Niners. They're 3-0. and oh. But I consider them in first place because they have that one more win. Russell Wilson, another great game. 17-23, 268 yards and four touchdowns. Jerry Goff, 29-49, 395 yards, a touchdown, the pick. He wasn't special at all in that game, but um, he did make some big plays down the stretch. But ultimately, um, Greg Zerline missed a 44-yard field goal. That would have won the game for the Rams. So um, that's ultimately what came back to bite him. So I can't really blame Goff for a missed field goal. Scoring-wise, um, Zerline put up two field goals in the first quarter, 6 nothing Rams. That... It's another um, thing that ultimately haunted the Rams that are a red zone offense. Tyler Lockett from Russell Wilson, 7-6. Second quarter, Metcalf from Wilson, 40 yards, 14-6. Goff to Cup um, made it a 14-13 game at halftime. Third quarter, 8-yard run for Todd Gurley, 20-14 Rams. Russell Wilson to David Moore, 10 yards, 21-20 Seattle. One yard run from Gurley, two point run conversion failed, 26 21. Fourth quarter, Jason Myers field goal made it 26 24. Third line field goal made it 29 24. And then Wilson to Chris Carson for five yards made it 39, or I'm sorry, 30 to 29. Two point conversion failed, and then the missed kick, and then uh, Seattle wins. And next up for Seattle, they have. The Browns in a matinee game. And then the Rams next up host the 49ers. So that's a huge game for the Los Angeles Rams come next week. Alrighty, college football. We had two games last night. There was an incredibly... Bad beat in the one that probably, uh, or I should say non-beat, that happened in the Temple East Carolina game. Temple came out on top 27-17. Temple is 4-1. ECU is 3-3. Anthony Russo, 23-34, 208 yards and a touchdown. And Holton Ehlers, 19-39, 229 yards and two touchdowns. The bad non-beat I'm talking about is that... um, There was a fumble, what should have been a fumble return for touchdown, but ultimately it was determined that uh, the uh, play call was blown dead after um, it was ruled that it was an incomplete pass rather than a um, a lost fumble by the receiver from East Carolina. That was just some wacky game. Temple comes away with the win. Georgia Southern over South Alabama, 20-17 in double overtime. Georgia Southern two and three, South Alabama one and five. So Georgia Southern survives and moves on here. Tyler Bass thirty-seven yard field goal in the second overtime for the win for Georgia Southern. And zero um, oh and two for uh, the college slate so far in terms of uh, the picks. The NHL last night's games. Rangers over the Jets, 6-4. A good win for the Rangers to open up the season. This was my surprise team from the East this year. And if they want to continue and make my prediction look good, you have to win games like this against teams that are you're about even with. And the Jets right now are a team that's about even with the Rangers because of all their defensive issues. Rangers 1-0-0. Winnipeg 0-1-0. Number one started the game with a goal and three assists. Mika Zibanejad, number two, started the game with a goal and two assists. Jacob Truba against his former team. Number three started the game with two goals. Blake Wheeler. Hurricanes over the Canadians, 4-3 in a shootout. A good win for Carolina. They are 1-0-0. Montreal 0-0-1. So Montreal gets a point. Number one started the game with the goal 
Martin Nesas, number two star of the game with a goal. Lucas Walmark, number three star of the game with 33 saves on 36 shots. Peter Morazic. Sabres over the Penguins, 3-1. to one. This was a great win for Buffalo. John Butchercross had them as his surprise playoff team from the East. They're 1-0-0. Pittsburgh 0-1-0. Connor Sherry with two goals against his former team. Number one star of the game. Number two star of the game is who assists Casey Millsat. Number three star of the game with the goal, Evgeny Malkin. Lightning over the Panthers, 5-2. The, the Lightning 1-0-0. Florida 0-1-0. Number one star of the game with the goal, Andre Palat. Number two star of the game with 35 saves. On 37 shots, Andre Vasilevsky, number three, started the game with three assists, Mikhail Sergachev. Predators over the Wild, 5 to 2, a good win for Nashville to start their season. Outscored the Wild 4 0 in the third after trailing 2 to 1. Nashville's 1 0 0. Minnesota is 0 1 0. Number one, started the game with a goal and assist, Ryan Ellis, number two, started the game with three assists in his Predators debut, Matt DeShane, number three, started the game with 22 saves on 20 shots, Pekka Rene. Bruins over the Stars, 2-1. The Bruins are 1-0-0. Dallas, 0-1-0. Number one star of the game with the goal, Brett Ritchie. Number two star of the game with the goal, Danton Hainan. And the number three star of the game with the goal, Roop Hints. Avalanche over the Flames, 5-3. A good win for Colorado. This was my Stanley Cup pick. They're 1-0-0. Calgary, 0-1-0. Number one star of the game with two goals, Mika Rontanen. Number two star of the game with an assist, Gabriel Landeskog. Number three star of the game with two goals, Junas Dasunki. The Ducks defeated the Coyotes 2-1, a good win for Anaheim, making their case as a surprise team in the West. Was that Derek that I saw that had a surprise pick for Anaheim? I think it was. Um, I know Bucci's down on him. Anaheim 1-0-0, Arizona 0-1-0. Number one star of the game with 32 saves on 33 shots, John Gibson. Number two star of the game with a goal, Cam Fowler. Number three star of the game with a goal, Derek Grant. Tonight's slate, we actually have a game during the day between the Blackhawks and the Flyers. It's the Global Series coming from... Paraguay, I believe. Yeah, it is Paraguay. No. Pergu. Should be on NHL Network. Two teams that, um, I think one of them makes the playoffs. The other one, I think, should be rebuilding. John Boutrecross had the Blackhawks as a surprise team from the West. I never really had a Cinderella surprise from the West. I thought about picking Vancouver to make it, but, um, I'm not sold on... Their offensive depth behind their top six and their defense, although they are up and coming there in the West. I just thought Arizona was a fluke last year, and Edmonton is Edmonton, so I couldn't go with the Oilers. So instead, I went with two surprises in the East, with Philadelphia actually being a top three in the Metro Division, and then the Rangers as the second wild card. But that should be a fun game between... Um, the two teams that faced off against one another in the Stanley Cup Final back in 2010. So that's a little bit of an interesting storyline. 7 o'clock, Maple Leafs Blue Jackets. This is the opener for the Blue Jackets, obviously. Pierre-Luc Dubois and Seth Jones, Zach Wierenski. So we're we'll interested to see how they look. Home opener for the New Jersey Devils as they host the uh, Winnipeg Jets, who are coming off their loss against the Rangers. Capitals at the Islanders. The Islanders home opener. We'll see how they look. Boots across picked them to make the playoffs. It's 10.30. The Golden Knights at the Sharks. So a rematch from the other day. And Vegas is actually favored on the road. So that's really interesting. Very, a, a lot of people are high on Vegas and think that they are the uh, lock division winner this year. But I think Boots across to Calgary in that division. So there's really no locks in terms of uh, division winners this year. And definitely, in my opinion, I mean, the safest bet, in my opinion, to win their respective division to me was Washington, not Vegas. Although Vegas was a pretty safe bet, but I thought Washington was a safe bet as well. Although that division has improved and the Pacific division is very weak, so I get why people thought that Vegas was the lock division winner this year.
All right. College football picks for week number six. Off to an 0-2 start. The Temple East Carolina bad beat cost me the over. And Georgia Southern almost um, lost to South Alabama. They didn't even come close to covering the spread. So take that for what it's worth. Maybe Georgia Southern isn't as good as I thought. All right. We're going to start with tonight. You have UCF at Cincinnati. UCF is laying three and a half. The over under sixty and a half. This is going to be a fun game in Cincinnati. A lot of people think that the under is a possibility because of Cincinnati's improved defense, but um, I think Cincinnati is a team that can score too. And obviously, UCF's a good offensive team, so maybe. They'll make Cincinnati's defense look vulnerable here. So I'm going to take the over 60 and a half here. And I'm going to take the Knights to win the game on the field. And by the way, the juice is in favor of UCF laying the three and a half of the minus 113. And then Cincinnati getting three and a half is minus 108. New Mexico at San Jose State. San Jose State is laying six and a half. The over under is 67. The pick here is New Mexico getting the points. San Jose State should not be favored over anybody right now. Maybe other than UConn and you could talk me into New Mexico State a little bit in UMass. But San Jose State is terrible and they're being judged by their win over an Arkansas team that disrespected them. So give me New Mexico getting 6.5. They're plus 180 on the money line. I'm going to say New Mexico wins the game on the field. And doing so, obviously, covering the six and a half. All right, the Saturday games. We're going to start with Maryland at Rutgers. Maryland is laying 14 and a half. The over-under is 55 and a half. Maryland's going to win this game on the field, obviously. They're a very good team. But giving you the over 55 and a half here. Yes, Rutgers is terrible. They have a new coach now, an intern coach. Maybe he does some tricks and whatnot to uh, put up maybe like 15, between 15 and 20 points and all. Maryland would have to do is put up 40. So there he goes. You're over. Maryland on the field. But the play here is over 55 and a half. Next up, TCU at Iowa State. Iowa State laying 3.5. The over-under is 43.5. Give me the Cyclones laying the 3.5. They're the better team. I think this is great value. And it is one of my best five plays of the weekend. And what's even more valuable, that you're getting them at minus 3.5. And and you don't really have to pay the big price. It's minus 103, so you win more money if... You get the bet right rather than when it's even or when the juice is kind of on the other side. Purdue at Penn State. Penn State's laying 28 and a half. The over under is 56. Give me Purdue getting the 28 and the hook. That's easy. I just think that Penn State shouldn't be that big of a favorite over a team that can score the football. I know Purdue lost last week, but they made that score look respectable against Minnesota. After being down big, I think Purdue can get some garbage time points here and backdoor Penn State. I think Penn State wins this game by 20. So give me Purdue getting the 28 and a half as the best play with obviously um, Penn State winning the game on the field. Iowa at Michigan. Michigan's laying three and a half. The over under is 47 and a half. Give me the Wolverines minus the three and a half. I think they're, this is a good spot for them to remind people that this is still a talented team. That was just a bad spot against Wisconsin for them. And there's a bad narrative now out there about how Michigan is a bad team and Jim Harbaugh's going to get fired and yada yada. So um, I think that bad narrative will go away for at least this week. So give me Michigan minus three and a half. I think they win this game by double digits. South Florida, UConn, South Florida is laying ten and a half. The over under is 49 and a half. 
Give me South Florida here to win and cover. I just think that UConn sucks, obviously, so um, UConn's pretty much an auto-bet ATS. Although, they backdoored UCF last week. But I just think that number's low. If this was maybe 20 and a half, I'd take UConn, but it's not. It's 10 and a half, and I don't see UConn making this competitive at all, as South Florida would get a much-needed win. Tulane at Army. Tulane's laying 2.5. The over-under is 43.5. The wrong team is favored here. So give me Army getting the 2.5. They'll win the game on the field. They're plus 115 on the money line. And this is just bizarre to me. I think people are overreacting to them barely um, beating Rice that first week. But the reason why they barely beat Rice is because they were looking ahead to the Michigan game. And then they almost and should have upset Michigan and they didn't. And I just think that Army's better than Tulane. So, especially at home, come on. Give me Army all day, every day, getting the two and a half and plus 115 on the other, on the money line. Go Army, beat Navy. That's my rant. And, again, the wrong team's favored in that game. Oklahoma State at Texas Tech. The Pokes are laying 10 and a half, the over under 63 and a half. Give me the Cowboys to win and cover the point spread. Yes, I think that this game could be competitive, obviously. But I just think that Oklahoma State is much better than Texas Tech in all aspects. Texas Tech's defense stinks. We saw that against Oklahoma. And I think that um, State can win this game by 17 points. I could see this being like a 45-27 to type of ball game. Wisconsin hosts Kent State. Wisconsin's line 35. The over-under is 59. Give me the over 59 here. I think Wisconsin can do that by themselves. Jonathan Taylor's going to run wild on Kent State. Oklahoma at Kansas. Oklahoma's line 31 and a half. The over-under 67 and a half. I'm going to be a little contrarian here and take the under 67 and a half. Oklahoma unders have been something that's been happening lately, although week one against Houston was a push. The under clicked um, not that long ago against um, Texas Tech last week. And there's another under for them. Oh, the UCLA game went under as well. That was the other one I had in my head. So Oklahoma unders have been a trend so far this season. I'm going to keep the tr- uh, that trend continuing. I think Oklahoma can win this game 40-20 to in that under would obviously still matter. Or 40 to 10, or 50 to 10 even. Utah State at LSU. Utah State is getting 27.5, the over under 73. I'm going to take another under here. I think that LSU is not going to show anything here. I think this is going to be a uh, going through the motions kind of game. I think their defense will make some plays, but I think that their offense will kind of be vanilla here. So give me the under 73, and I could see LSU winning this game like, let's say like 38 to 16 or something like that. Next up, you have Boston College at Louisville at 1230. Louisville's laying 5.5, the over under 61. Give me Louisville minus the points. I just don't think Boston College... Is that great? And I like what I've seen from Louisville lately. Like, they hung in that game with Florida State. They are competitive against Notre Dame. And this is a game at home that they should be able to win. So, give me Louisville minus the 5.5. Next up at 3 o'clock, you have Eastern Michigan at Central Michigan. Eastern's laying 6. The over-under is 53.5. I like the over here. I am. I think that both these offenses will put up their fair share of points. I think Eastern will win on the field. So, give me the over in that game. Auburn at Florida. Auburn's laying 3D over under 48.5. Everyone and their brother loves Florida this week, and I understand why. They tend to win a big game like this every year. Yada, yada. But here's the thing. Auburn was doubted a few weeks ago as a three-point dog at Texas A&M. 
And they went out there and impressed a bunch of people, including myself, and got that win on the road. It's never pretty with Auburn, but here's the underrated thing, which I think is the best unit on this field, the Auburn defense. The Auburn defense is excellent. And, yeah, obviously Florida, I don't trust their backup quarterback, the guy that's replacing Franks. Not that I thought that Franks was anything special. But all the morons out there that are picking Florida and the reason why they're an underdog is because of no Franks. And I actually thought going into this game that Auburn would be a favorite because they're a top 10 team and they, they um, really have a knack of winning some big games on the road as well. I had them as a minus one at Florida as my projection because I think on a neutral, I would make it Auburn by four. That's why I had Auburn by one. But, yeah, I'm going to take Auburn here to cover the three. Do I feel good about it? No. Worst-case scenario, I'll push. So give me Auburn. Minus the three points in that game. And what I think will be competitive, don't get me wrong. I just think it's a defense slugfest, a bunch of turnovers. I don't think Bo Nix will have that great of a game, but I just think their defense will be too much for Florida's offense. Virginia Tech at Miami. Miami's only 14. The over-under is 46. This one's tough for me. I don't think Miami should be this big of a favorite. But at the same time, Virginia Tech has just been atrocious. That performance against Duke was just outright pathetic. I'm going to take the under 46. I think both of these defenses will be strong. And I think this could be like a 27... Or, I'm sorry, maybe like a 23-20 type of game. 27-17, maybe. Ball State at Northern Illinois. Ball State's getting 4.5. The over-under is 54.5. I'm laying the points with Northern Illinois. I just think they're the better team. Got it at 5.5 and, and went down a point because people like Ball State. I don't trust Ball State. I trust Northern Illinois. Give me Northern Illinois minus 4.5. Baylor at Kansas State. Kansas State's laying a point and a half. The over-under is 48.5. I believe Baylor actually opened as a favorite in this game, but I would have disagreed with that. I do think that Kansas State should be favored here. My guess on this line, when I did guess the lines on Monday, was Kansas State by three. And I think I'm getting value here with the Purple Cats of Kansas State. So um, give me Manhattan to get be ruckus, and I think Kansas State bounces back from their loss against Oklahoma State and gets a win here over Baylor to uh, end Baylor's hopes of going undefeated. Illinois at Minnesota. Minnesota's laying 14. The over-under is 57. Illinois overs, to me, have become auto bets, and it's worked for me over the past couple of weeks, and I think that continues here. I think that this game could be like a 37-23 game, and that would still be an over. Western Michigan at Toledo. Toledo's laying a point and a half. The over-under is 72 and a half. Everyone and their brother loves Western Michigan to win this game outright at Toledo. But Toledo's a good team in their own right. So give me the Rockets laying a point and a half here. I think it'll be a competitive game. I think it'll be a great game in the back. Two of the better teams in that conference. A lot of points. But give me Toledo minus one and a half. Ohio at Buffalo. Ohio's laying 3.5. The over-under is 51. I'm going to take Ohio here, laying the 3.5. The juice is t- going towards Buffalo, minus 14, with the plus 3.5. The minus 3.5 is minus 107. So give me Ohio, minus the 3.5. I just think they're better than Buffalo this year. But I know this feels like a bounce-back spot for Buffalo, but I just think, don't think Buffalo is as good as they were last year. Bowling Green at Notre Dame. Notre Dame's laying 46. The over-under is 62. Give me the over here. I think Notre Dame... We'll score a lot of points here. I think I had the under when they played New Mexico State. 
or I'm sorry, that was New Mexico, and they went um, over the total. So um, I think that Notre Dame can get to 50 by themselves, and all Bowling Green has to do is get to 13, and that works. So there's my pick, over 62. Marshall at Middle Tennessee. Marshall's laying 40 over under 54. Upset special. Give me the um, the Blue Raiders plus the four. I think they win the game on the field plus 155 on the money line. I just think Middle's due for a good performance. Marshall coming off that win over Cincinnati. I just think that they are peaking ahead a little bit. So give me Middle Tennessee getting four. They'll win the game on the field plus 155. Arkansas State at Georgia State. Arkansas State's laying seven. The over under 69 and a half. Give me Arkansas State minus the points. I don't think Georgia State's very good. They're just getting respect because they beat Tennessee. So give me Arkansas State minus seven to continue their role. Air Force at Navy. Air Force is laying three to over and there's 45 and a half. Give me Navy getting the three minus 106. So there's value there. I think they win the game on the field. They're plus 133 on the money line. So Navy gets a signature win over uh, an improved Air Force team. So there's that. The game I'm really intrigued by, Texas at West Virginia. Texas is laying 10.5, the over-under 61. Give me the Mountaineers plus the 10.5. Getting the Mountaineers with um, double digits at home with that crowd against a ranked team. I think that they're going to be into it, those fans. Texas has a lot of injuries in their secondary. I think Austin Kendall in that offense takes advantage of that. Like they took advantage of the weaknesses of NC State a few weeks ago. Do I think they can win the game outright? Absolutely. I think they have a chance. But do I think they will? No. I think Texas wins by like four points. I could see this being like a 38-34 Longhorns win and they have to sweat it out at the end. As long as the cover's in play, I'm cool. I just think West Virginia covers, although I wouldn't rule them out to win the game outright either. Next up at 345, Memphis at UL Monroe. Memphis is laying 14 and a half, the over under 63 and a half. Giving the over 63 and a half here at Memphis, I just think that they are um, a team that is going to score, score, and score as well as UL Monroe. So giving the over 63 and a half. North Carolina at Georgia Tech. North Carolina is laying 10 and a half, the over under is 49. I think there's a good bounce back spot for Sam Howell to get right. He goes up against the Swiss cheese defense in Georgia Tech. I think they win this game by double digits, obviously. So give me the Tar Heels minus 10 and a half. Troy at Missouri. Missouri is laying 25, the over under 66. Give me the over here. I think both of these offenses can score and score and score. And I think that both teams can eclipse 30, potentially. Like, I could see this being like a 57 to 31 type of game. Northwestern's at Nebraska. Nebraska's laying 70 over under 49. Giving Nebraska minus 7. Good bounce back spot for them. I think they're being undervalued here. Northwestern is terrible offensively. Everybody loves Northwestern as that cute underdog that can win outright. I'm not going to doubt Northwestern per se, but this season. But I just don't like the spot here for them. So give me Nebraska minus seven to win this game by two touchdowns. Next up at 430, you have Arizona, Colorado. Colorado's laying one and a half, the over under 63. Give me Colorado minus the points. Although I'm aware that a situation like this a few weeks ago against Air Force, it came back to bite me. But the value is on Colorado with the minus 107 with the minus four and a half. So give me Colorado here. I think it's close. I think it's maybe like an eight-point game. I can see this being like a 38-30 Colorado win. Six o'clock, Western Kentucky at Old Dominion. Western's laying three and a half. The over-under is 42. Give me Old Dominion plus the three and a half. It's minus 108. They're plus 135 on the money line. I think they win the game on the field. Western Kentucky had an upset last week. I think they get picked off this week. So give me Old Dom to win the game on the field plus three and a half against the spread. 7 o'clock, Georgia at Tennessee. Georgia's laying 25. The over-under is 51 and a half. Give me Georgia minus the 25. They're just way better than Tennessee. Tennessee's a mess. Maybe the worst team in the SEC East. So give me Georgia minus the 25. Yeah, I know there's look-ahead potential here, but I'm not buying that. Jay Fromm's going to have a big day throwing the football. 
I think they win by 30. Tulsa at SMU. Tulsa is getting 13. The over under 64. Give me Tulsa plus the 13. I just think that SMU is going to come out there and try to show off and prove that their rankings for real. And I love betting against the newly ranked, hot ranked team all the time. I, that's something I learned, and it normally comes through for me. So give me Tulsa plus the 13. Although I still think that uh, SMU will win the game, maybe by 10. Rice against UAB. UAB is only nine and a half. The over under is 44 and a half. Give me UAB minus the nine and a half. They're just better than Rice. The juice is actually on UAB. It's minus 114, but who cares? I like UAB in this spot. UMass and Florida International. FIU is laying 26. The over under is 68, but currently off the board. I'll just take it at 68. I'm going to take the over. Both of these teams are going to score and score and score. And I think FIU obviously will win the game big. Next up at 7.30, you have Michigan State at Ohio State. Michigan State's getting 20. The over-under is 49. I love Sparty getting 20. This is one of my locks of the week, one of my best plays of the week. So give me Michigan State getting 20. I'm not suggesting they'll win the game on the field. I just think it's closer than people think. I'm going to say that the Buckeyes win by a score of like 34 to 17 or something like that. And even that will win me my cover with the plus 20. Found the build against Ole Miss. Ole Miss is laying 7.5. The over under is 63.5. Contrarian play, but I'm taking Ole Miss minus the 7.5. They're just better than Vanderbilt from head to toe. And I think they win this game by double digits. And Vandy, to me, just is a team that really can't play a lick of defense. Although I think they'll put up some points. 8 o'clock, Liberty at New Mexico State. Liberty's laying 3.5. The over under 61.5. Give me the over 61.5. Both of these teams are going to score, score, score. Another popular trend so far this year is New Mexico State overs. That continues here. UTSA at UTEP. UTEP's laying 1. The over under is 45.5. Give me UTSA to win on the field, but my play here is over 50, or 45.5. I think that's a low number. For these two teams, I think that this could be like a 30-20 game. And even that would qualify as an over. Pitt at Duke. Duke's laying 5. The over-under is 48. Give me Duke minus 5. I just think that Duke's a team that's heading in the right direction. I think this is a team that will probably make a bowl game now. Again, that big upset win at Vatek. And then uh, if they get this win here against Pitt, then... Bam, I think that that's a bolt team, although that puts Pitt on the bubble a little bit. So give me Duke minus five in a game that I think will be competitive throughout. Won't be floored if Pitt won the game, but I'm going to take Duke minus the five because I just like what I saw from them last week. Cal at Oregon. Oregon's laying 19. The over-under is 47. I'm taking Cal plus the 19. That's too big of a number for Oregon to be laying. I'm not impressed with Oregon at all. And Cal's a team that can play defense. Yeah, their offense stinks. But I think that their defense can stop Herbert a little bit. If you see Herbert against a good defense, then it's not automatic that he's going to be great, as you saw in that first game against Auburn. Even the game against Stanford, he wasn't great either. Stanford's defense isn't bad at all. So, um, And the problem for Stanford is that they just can't score. So give me Cal plus the 19. I think that this game is closer than the experts think. I think that Oregon probably wins this game like, let's say 27-13 to 13 or something. That will qualify as a Cal cover. And by the way, the juice is on Cal with minus 112. Oregon State at UCLA at 9 o'clock. UCLA is laying 5.5. The over-under is 65.5. I'm taking UCLA minus the points. I think this is a bounce-back spot for the Bruins. And the Beavers, to me, on the road, I don't know if they could do it. If this game was at um, Corvallis, I'd take Oregon State on the field. But um, no, UCLA is home, and I think they get their first home win of the season. So give me UCLA to go to 2-1 and in Pac-12 play. Next up at 10 o'clock, you have San Diego State at Colorado State. Colorado State's getting 7.5. The, the over-under is 51. Another popular trend pick this year is Colorado State overs. 
That's going to continue this week. So give me the over 51 for San Diego State. Colorado State, I obviously think that San Diego State will win on the field. 10.30, Washington and Stanford. Washington's only 15. The over-under is 52. This was a tough play. I'm going to take Stanford getting to 15. I just think that this game's going to be competitive. And not that I think that... I just don't think Stanford will win. I think Washington's obviously going to win. I just think this game's going to be more competitive. David Shaw is not a guy that's going to let his team quit. They had a nice win against Oregon State last week, they, although they did not cover the number. I did get my cover, but I just didn't get my win. But anyway, I'm taking the 15 with Stanford. Hinging on a prayer, I'm going to say that the Huskies win like a 30-23 to 23 type of ball game. And then the over would just hit, too. That'd be weird. And last but not least for college football, Boise State at UNLV. Boise's laying 22. The over-under is 57. I'm going to take the Rebels getting the 22 here against Boise. Um, Boise will win. I just think that UNLV is competitive throughout the game. I'm just going to say that Boise wins by 14 points. That's all. Now we're going to switch over to the NFL. I have some interesting picks for you guys this week. I am 0-1 straight up so far for the week with um, the Seahawks being the first favorite to win on Thursday Night Football this year. The, the underdogs obviously are 5-0 and against the spread on Thursday Night Football. So I'm 1-0 against the spread for... Uh, the NFL so far this week, but um, all in one straight up picks. New England at Washington. New England's laying 15. The over under is 42 and a half. New England's obviously coming off uh, their win at Buffalo against the Bills in the game where Josh Allen got concussed. Washington, um, obviously, that terrible loss against a bad Giants team made a bad Giant defense look good, and that's pathetic. Washington's the worst team in the NFC. Not Arizona, not the Giants. It's them. So, Washington stinks. They can't score. Their defense is not that terrible. And obviously the best defense, perhaps in the league, definitely the AFC so far has been the New England Patriots. So, give me the under 42.5. I think the Patriots win this game by a score of... Let's go... 31-10 to 10 as my final score there. That would qualify as an under. Buffalo at Tennessee. Buffalo's getting three. The over-under is 38.5. Josh Allen's in concussion protocol. The Bills obviously coming off their home loss against the Pats to end their hopes of going undefeated. And then Tennessee obviously coming off that win against the um, Atlanta Falcons on the road. Picking the Bills here makes me nervous because of the Josh Allen issue. But I'm not sold on the Titans at all. I'm going to take the Bills here to win. But when my blog and my picks come out, if Allen's out, then my pick is going to probably change to the Titans. So I'm going to asterisk my Bills prediction here. And say that they win this game like 27 to 20. But if no Allen, then I'm going to say that the Titans win like 20 to 13 or something like that. So taking the Bills from now, by the way, plus 128 on the money line. Baltimore at Pittsburgh. Baltimore's laying 3D over under 44 and a half. For a while, I was leaning Baltimore, but the more I think about it, I think that Pittsburgh's the right side here. I think that Baltimore, people are starting to realize that their hot start was probably a fluke going up against the Dolphins and the Cardinals. And they probably shouldn't even have beaten the Cardinals, by the way. The Cardinals probably should have won that game. So, um, give me the Steelers getting three, and I think they win the game on the field. 
and they are plus 155 on the money line. Obviously, Ravens coming off that terrible home loss against the Browns, and the Steelers coming off the Monday night home win over the Bengals. This is a good opportunity for the Steelers to get back in this uh, race. So give me the Steelers plus three at home, and I think they win the game on the field. Let's say the Steelers win this game by a score of 26-24. Very close game. I'm going to say that their kicker kicks a field goal at the buzzer to end the game. The Jets at the Eagles. The Jets are getting 14 and a half. The over under is 44. Jets obviously coming off and coming off their bye. Eagles coming off their big win at Green Bay. Um, no Sam Darnold. I'm going to take the Eagles to win this game on the field, but my play here is the over 44. I just think that the Jets defense is terrible, and the Eagles offense found some rhythm last week against the Packers who are a much better defensive team than the Jets. So give me Philadelphia here. I'm going to say they win this game by a score of 33-13, to and that would barely hit the over. Buccaneers at the Saints. The Bucks are getting 2.5. The over-under is 46. The Lions just keep moving in favor of the Bucks. I got them at three and a half early in the week. It's on the two and a half, and I'll take that. The juice is on the Saints, so you can get some value with the Bucks at minus one hundred seven with the the plus two and a half. I think the Bucks went on the field. I think that Jameis Winston's better than Teddy Bridgewater. I think that the key to beating the Saints is to throw against them rather than running on them. Although their pass defense has some names on it, but they really haven't performed. Like, look, Russell Wilson. Granted, most of that was in garbage time when they beat the Seahawks a few weeks ago through on that defense, although Russell Wilson's great. Jamison Winston is obviously not, but anyway, I think the Bucks will win this game. Let's go 27-23 to 23, uh, Tampa Bay on the road. Next up you have the Bears at the Raiders. The Bears are laying five. The over-under is 40.5. I'm taking the Bears minus the five. The juice is on the Raiders at minus 115, so I'm getting value here with the Bears at minus 106. Um, Chase Daniel, there's a lot of people that think that he's better than Mitch Trubisky. I'm not one of those people. Chase Daniel is somebody that people are judging on because he had a couple good games in the Andy Reid offense. He's not that guy. He's Thinks, but the main reason why I'm taking the Bears, Khalil Mack revenge game against his former team. Khalil Mack is going to be a monster. He's going to sack Derek Carr a thousand times, like literally. And I just think that the Bears will win this game by double digits. I'm going to say it's 26 to 16 Chicago Bears, and they obviously get the cover as well. Bears obviously coming off the big win against the Vikings. Raiders obviously coming off that win at Indy. So let down spot for the Raiders after a nice Indy win. Falcons at the Texans. Uh, Falcons obviously coming off that dreadful loss at home against the um, Titans. The Texans coming off the loss against Carolina. This is a good bounce back spot for the Texans. They're laying 40. Over under is 49. So, give me the Texans minus the four. It went down, and actually the juice is on the Texans at minus 113, getting the Falcons with plus four is minus 108. So, um, give me the Texans here. I think that Deshaun Watson and company bounce back. Atlanta has some injuries in their secondary, so um, I think Watson takes advantage of that, and that offense will look good, and they'll improve to, what would they be, t- uh, three and two? Yes. No. Yes. Three and two. They did. That's right. They Their losses were against the Panthers and the Saints. So they'll go to three and two. Vikings at the Giants. Vikings laying five. The over under is 43 and a half. Give me the Vikings minus five. I think that they're undervalued in this spot. Everybody's trashing Kirk Cousins. And rightfully so because he's been terrible and not lived up to the contract and yada yada. Stephon Diggs wants to be traded, and I get all the reasons to pick the Giants as like an anti-Vikings slash Kirk Cousins thing. 
But the Vikings defense is the best unit on the field in this game. The worst unit on this on the field in this game is the Giants defense. So I think that Adam Thielen, Kyle Rudolph, Dalvin Cook, and Stephon Diggs will have big games. Cousins will have a good fantasy day. Um, Daniel Jones will regress and look like a rookie. So give me the Vikings minus five. And I think the Vikings win this game by a score of 34 to 17. And um, Daniel Jones, there's going to be some critics out there, unfortunately, for him. Jacksonville at Carolina. Jacksonville's getting 3D over under 40. Give me the Jags plus the three and riding Gardner Minshew again. Kyle Allen kind of regressed from that game against the um, Cardinals. Jags defense is good. They'll win this game. So give me the Jaguars plus the three. The juice is actually on Carolina side at minus 115. So I'm getting Jacksonville minus 106. Plus 150 on the money line. So give me the Jaguars to win a low-scoring affair. Ugly game. I'm going to say it's 17-13 to 13 Jacksonville on the road to win their third straight on their Gardner bid shoe. The Bengals host the Cardinals. The Bengals are running 3D over under 47. Give me the Cardinals to get their first win of the year. They're getting three. The juice is actually on them at minus 118. I think this will be a high-scoring game as well. So the over 47 is enticing. They're plus 135 on the money line. I think the Cardinals are just due for a win. Kyler Murray's due for a win. Like I said, the better quarterback here is Kyler Murray, not Andy Dalton. This is an anti-Dalton play as well. So give me the Cardinals here. It would be a competitive game, of course. I'm going to say that they win. Like, Let's go with 27-20 to 20 Arizona. Denver at the Chargers. Denver obviously coming off that heartbreaking loss against the uh, um, Jags and Gardner Minshew. Chargers coming off uh, their win at Miami, their little get-right game. I think the Chargers will win the game on the field, but give me Denver plus the six. I just think that this is a competitive game, field goal game either way. Denver's always in these games. They're the best winless team in the league by far. So give me Denver plus six. I'm going to say that the Chargers win this game by a score. Hmm. I'm going to give it a weird score. 24-23 LA for the win. Denver covers. Packers at the Cowboys. Cowboys laying three and a half. The over under is 47 and a half. Give me the Cowboys minus the three and a half here. They're in a clear bounce back spot after that disastrous offensive showing against New Orleans and Teddy Bridgewater. Green Bay coming off their loss against the Eagles. So this is a bounce back spot for one of these teams, and I'm going to say it's Dallas, who I think is the more talented team. And I'm going to say that in what should be a competitive game throughout, I'm going to say that Dallas will win 30-20. to I think that um, both quarterbacks will have moments. I think the Cowboys D can have a couple moments in this game. But I think that the secondaries of both of these teams could be leaky at the times, as you saw with Green Bay against um, the Eagles. Cowboys secondary has not faced a good quarterback yet this season, and this is the first time they're playing a good quarterback, so I, th- I could see them giving up some points. Maybe it, it, it turns out to be a garbage time touchdown or whatever, but I do think the Cowboys will win this game and win by double digits. Although the over 47 and a half is enticing as well. Sunday Night Football, the Colts are at the Chiefs. The Chiefs are playing 11. The over-under is 56. Give me the Chiefs minus the 11. They're the way better team than the Colts. I think Jacoby Brissett has proved to be overrated. That was a terrible performance against the Raiders. They hurt my feelings in that game. And I just think that that is an overrated team, period. And Andrew Luck has missed more than ever. So give me the Chiefs. They'll win this game going away. I'm going to say that they win this game like 30 to 10 and Patrick Mahomes will show people why he's the MVP yet again. And the over under is 56. Um I'm going to just stay away from that. Although it'll probably end up being an over and I could see a world where the Colts score in garbage time and the Chiefs win like 37 to 20 or something like that and even oh that would be the over. But I'm going to say it's 30-10. to 10. Brissett will be terrible. And uh, 
I think that's a sneaky under. Monday night, the Browns at the 49ers. The 49ers are laying five. The over-under is 47. That line is way too high. And guess what? I'm taking the Browns getting five, and I think the Browns will win this game outright. Plus 180 on the money line. I think the 49ers are an overrated football team. They have injuries in the secondary. Jason Verrett's hurt. That's a loss for them. Richard Sherman's washed up. I think Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry and their tight ends will have big games. Nick Chubb as well. And I love Cleveland. They're getting five. They'll win the game on the field. And I think that will it'll show who's the best team in the AFC North, and that is the Cleveland Browns. As bad as a coach Freddie Kitchens is, he has the most talented team, and talent wins in the NFL. And I've seen bad coaches make the playoffs before. It'll probably happen this year with uh, Kitchens. It happened a few years back with Ben McAdoo, and then he was fired and after they went 3-13 and the next year. Or he was fired in the middle of the year. But um, anyway, Browns will get the win here on the road on Monday Night Football. Close competitive game. I'm going to say the Browns win a high-scoring game, like 31-26. And Baker Mayfield will have another fine performance. Best bet of the day brought to you by DraftKings. So you have the four baseball playoff games. You have college football. You have some other stuff going on. Oh, I missed the uh, WNBA Finals pick. I'll give that out real quick for Game 3. I'm going to say that the Mystics bounce back and get the win in Game 3, regardless of um, Deladon's status. I just think that they'll step up in that game, and even though she may be out. And if uh, the Sun win this game, I think that they might win the series. So uh, give me the uh, Mystics on the road on Sunday afternoon. Forgot about that. But anyway, best bet. Here we go. I'm going to start with baseball. Give me the Astros. They're minus 265. Cardinals are actually favored on the road. I I like that I'm getting the Braves at plus money here, plus 105. Yankees are minus 195 tonight against the Twins. I'll take them. And the Nats are plus 133 at the Dodgers. So the biggest underdog on the board is Tampa Bay at plus 225. Then the Twins at plus 170. And the um, safest underdog play, I think, is the Braves at plus 105. Although the Nats are enticing too, so... That gives up to like 9-1. to one. I'm going to do some hockey in here too. I'm going to pick a couple games that I think um, have a chance to be somewhat locks. I'm going to take the... Hmm. This is tough. I will give you a hockey play. I'm going to go with Toronto on the road at Columbus. That's going to be my hockey pick. And then... So college football, I'm taking the Knights of UCF on the money line just to win the game. They are minus 180, so I'm going to roll with them. And then I'm going to roll with New Mexico on the money line at plus 180. So this is a shade above 70 to 1. I'm wagering... 41 cents, pay out $29.43. That's it for the podcast today. I'll be back on Monday recapping uh, the baseball playoffs, the football playoffs, or the football playoffs, uh, the uh, football games, WNBA finals, guess the lines for week seven of the college football season, and my best bet as well. Hope you guys have a great weekend, everybody.